everybody. Welcome back to Rock Talk Lapidary, the place where we get together and we learn it as much as we can from as many different people as we possibly can. Uh, today we do have an extra special guest named John Rowland. He is the CEO of Highland Park Lapidary. Um, but before we get over to that uh, part of our show, I do have a few bit of information. Uh, the first being we are now on Spotify. So if you miss this live, you can check us out over there on Spotify. And the name is uh, Rock Talk Lapidary. And we do have some other news we'll be coming out with at the end of the show. Uh, but to start, I um, we do a giveaway for uh, people that come on and comment and share information with us and talk to us while we're live. Uh, we do pick a name from there. And this uh, two weeks ago, we picked uh, Bill. And Bill sent us this great video. And I'm going to show it to you guys really quick because it just shows the what we're trying to, to do with this community here. Hey, folks. It's Bill. It's Saturday. I just got a present in the mail. Thursday night I was on a podcast with Rock and Raccoon with her and her four other, five other guests talking about different types of rocks and how to polish them and how to make jewelry and stuff like that. And I was one of the lucky winners of the weekly drawing. So in my package here, I got, she sent me some stickers and an assortment of beautiful rocks plus a necklace that she made with some quartz and looks like part of um, dinosaur bone and another beautifully polished rock she has a Facebook group Rock and Raccoon and Crystal Market so there's her information and I just wanted to give her a shout out and say thank you for what you sent me and have a great day I just think that was so sweet so for this week's giveaway I'm gonna show you guys real quick what we're gonna do uh, this is a lapidary journal by me uh, there is a link if anyone wants to purchase this in our description um, but it is a, the just a blank journal with a blank spot on top so you can draw your designs out you can uh, write down your calculated measurements that sort of thing uh, very very handy and then um, I do want to correct Bill I did not make that necklace um, this is going to be in this week's drawing as well this was made these these were all made by Jackie Binder she's a good friend of mine over there on Facebook can't go wrong with a mustache sticker a small iris agate and uh, let's see a few more pieces of rock we've got some honey calcite which I tumbled and polished labradorite rough dinosaur rough dinosaur rough and a little tiny itty bitty piece of Tiffany stone just to say you have some so without further ado, let me bring on my other co-hosts who are amazing and uh, they are all um, admins over on my Facebook groups. So they do double duty here for me. So let's bring on Dave first. Dave, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you tonight. It's good to see you, too. You look all spiffy in your button-up collar. That's uh, nice. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, working in lapidary is my dream job, but my real job is as a teacher. So, you know, when I get there home, this is what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Dave. Let's welcome in Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Hi, guys. How are you? We are great. I'm glad to see you tonight. You, too. Sorry, I forgot I still had my apron on. I was cutting stones earlier and I never took my apron off. So I was taking my apron off. So sorry about that. Oh, you do um, such an excellent job of cutting stones too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm um, so really excited about tonight's show. Um, so I'm Courtney King. I'm with CNS Services, uh, Cabs and Stones. Uh, cutting cabs is what I do. That's my passion is cutting rocks and sharing it with uh, anybody that wants them. 
Excellent. Oh, I do want to show off something that you sent me that was a gift. And now that I have my good camera and people can see it. Yeah. Oh, look at that. It is so sparkly. So pretty. Thank you for that. That was a really nice Very gift. Welcome. Absolutely. And then uh looks like we have a Ryan. Hi Ryan, welcome to the show. Hello. How's everybody doing? Good. <laughs> we are doing good. Glad <laughs> to see you. Dave, you look so formal. I know, I just telling them I got off work, you know, I sit in a classroom all day, so when I get home. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then new to the show starting tonight, we have Brad. Brad is also one of our admins, and um, welcome aboard, Brad. Hi, Brad. Yes, I didn't have much of a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I know, Kristen I mean. I showed up at the, rock, at the Crystal Festival last weekend and handed me a set of earphones and a mic and said, hey, you have no excuse be on the show, so I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> We are happy to have you, Brad. Yes. So, um, just with uh, the way the show is going to be run tonight, we are just going to sit around and ask some questions of John and, and pick his brain. So, you might want to get a notebook and pen out. And uh, with right. that said, thank you. Welcome aboard, John. We appreciate you being here. Hi, everybody. Hey, John. Hey, John. Good to finally yeah, see I you face to face. Yeah, I'm, I'm still over here in China. I've been here now three years straight because uh, wow. the border restrictions, and I didn't dare oh, walk wow. away from the factory because we've just been so incredibly busy. Oh yeah, I I, I like your guys' mission, um, and one of the reasons why I thought it was really great to come on here and join you guys and talk is that I really feel that there is a strong resurgence. Uh, in the hobby. There's a huge number of people that, you know, are coming into the hobby. You know, you got the baby boomers who are all retiring. And the reality is, if you ask any kid when they're young, whether they like rocks, pretty much no kid is ever going to say, oh, no, I don't like rocks. They all like rocks. We all liked rocks as kids. And so Absolutely. being able to find something that's uh, inspiring and mentally stimulating and a healthy hobby rather than sitting on the couch and watching television. Lapidary is a great, great, great art. And, you know, it's fun. It, it kind of separates you from what's going on and you're just focused right on the task at hand. And that's, that's so key. So what part of China are you in? I'm in Shenzhen. When Shenzhen is at the very, 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 very south, right across the bay from Hong Kong. Yep. Okay. City wow. of 25 million people. Wow. And the worst drivers in the world, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think you Utah have, could have them beat. You have no idea. <laughs> it's really, really. Uh, I mean, you, you think in the States, people have been driving for you know, a long time. Right. And, and, you know, Shenzhen is, as a city, 50 years old, something like that. So pretty much everybody that's driving now, they're all beginners. Right. Yeah. That's pretty young for a city, right? Yeah. Interesting. And there's a lot so, of cars. Right. So is that where <laughs> your, most of your main factory is, is there? Our factory is is in the north part of the city in a place called Songgang, and um, it's right at the top border of Shenzhen before you go into Dongguan. But the thing about uh, this area that's really, really important is that all of the uh, supply chain is here. Right. Everything. Like, when I first started Highland Park, I, I my first year I was building in Texas right. and I was just getting my butt kicked because I'm shipping material all over the country because nothing is all in one place. And right. the shipping, it was killing me then. Now today, the shipping has gone even crazier. So it would be even worse. Here, all of my suppliers are five minutes from me and they all deliver okay. for free. Oh, nice. The only thing I ship in is, is, is motors. 
Okay. And that comes from Shanghai area. Right. Nice. Nice. So it's people. People will always assume you're you're in China for cheap labor, and and labor is not a big part of uh, what we build anyway. Um, but the labor is not cheap. No. It's no longer cheap. That okay. that that uh, era is over. Right. The factory rent is more than factory rent in America. Really? Wow. That's interesting. Yep. So much demand. Uh, if I buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks here, it's a dollar more than in America. Wow. Well, I can wow. tell you, I own one of your machines, and mm -hmm. there is nothing cheap about it whatsoever. Right. That's right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I think we all have something. Um, well, you know. Um, I when I was 10, I got my first saw. That was 1970. And my first saw was a 10 inch Highland Park. Now, unfortunately for me, it was the gravity feed. And I had so many problems with it because I couldn't get the right combination for how to get it to cut right. And, and my experience at that point in time definitely influences me in how I think about designing equipment to make it much, much simpler and easier for people to be successful. So most of my machines are are going to be power feed because it removes that mystery and that, you know, understanding of how do you set up a gravity feed and get it to cut right, not put too much weight on it, but have enough weight on it. And all, you know, like it just removes all that. Yeah, I um, love my so power people feed. can put a rock in and make sure it's tight in the vise, and they can start cutting, and they can be successful. Because being successful is what people will keep them in the hop. Yes. Right. If you're not successful with the thing, you're like, well, I'm going to go do something else that's easier. Right. Right. Yeah, I love my power feed. <laughs> you couldn't pay me to do a gravity feed. No, thank yeah. you. I am, I am, I am actually breaking my rule a little bit. I, uh, have you ever heard of the old great Western saws? Great yeah. Western was a fringe company that, um, I actually met the sun not long ago. Um, and they make, they, well, no longer make, they stopped making them quite a few years back, but they make a saw that's a gravity feed, but they did something different. They put a hydraulic cylinder in it. So the hydraulic cylinder controls the movement. Okay. And it's actually the only gravity feed saw that I consider, other than a drop saw, that I consider a, a workable design. So I'm actually going to bring both the 18 and 24 inch Great Western gravity feeds back. Oh, nice. The reason why I'm doing that is that because they don't have a power feed, they can be less expensive and right. they're a little smaller right. and like when i started i started doing all the big saws i did the 18 i did the 24 um then i did a bull wheel then i did the 16 all of the original hp designs and that's where i focused and then i don't know it's probably been oh, five years ago i started i was standing in quartzite and you know you, you do a lot of visiting and you know chatting with people in quartzite which is a great thing about it and these folks came by and they were looking at i had this model 12 my like my precision agate saw and they were really liking it but they they it was clear they didn't have enough money for it and i thought to myself you know i really got to figure out how to do a lower cost but quality machine that can help those people get into the hop. And so that's when I came out with all the desktop saws, which basically they're, they're based on the uh, lower tone designs. And those lower tone designs, by the way, are, uh, or at least the, H, the 12 and the 14, they're based on um, a Spartan. Spartan is the original company that did that design. And then that design was uh, basically adopted by Lorton. But there were some shortcomings in the design for like the arbor bearings and the cross feet of the carriage being sloppy and stuff. And so I changed all that and, uh, and rectified what I consider the problems that would 
cause a beginner to have more difficulty. And I came out with those saws a lot, lot less expensive. Well, you know, we live in a hurry up world now, John, and, and nobody wants to have to wait to get one to work the right way. We want it out of the box and we want it up and running, right? Yeah. Oh, it's Amazon. It's the Amazon world. And right. we want it, like yes. we order it, we want it to ship the next day. And I'll tell you that, that has been our biggest challenge over the last two years because, you know, when COVID hit, we were all like, we were pretty nervous because, you know, okay, people, people need food, they need to pay their rent, and they need gas. Right. Lapidary, well, that's a maybe. Right. But what, what occurred is that we just blew up. We, like this year, I built twice as much equipment as last year, and last year I built more than 2020. Wow, and that really doesn't surprise me with the number of people that were, you know, when they shut everything down, now you're at home all the time. And a yeah. lot of people found rocks again or found lapidary or found, right. you know, something new to do in their now yeah. spare time. All that time they used to spend commuting or whatever, they didn't have to spend anymore. So now we can spend more time doing other stuff, right? Right, right. Um, so I, I think that played a big part of it too, but I was concerned, same thing, like what's gonna happen here, you know? Um, now, since it's changing a little bit this past few months and people are now back going to rock shows again and going to, you know, things in person again, I'm finding a little bit of the online stuff is slowing down. I mean, it's still active and it, it's still good, but it's definitely not as busy as it was a year and a half ago. Yeah, well, so it's things usually slow down a little bit anytime you get around elections, too. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. Get, that's true. Everybody gets yeah. distracted. Right. And, right. and then, of right. course, it finishes and then nothing changes and we can all go back to our stock. That's right. That's right. <laughs> as soon as the stock market starts coming back and, and inflation settles down a little bit, you know, that's been a big part of it lately, too. All the inflation is the the quote unquote disposable income is not as disposable as it was. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, but uh, I wanted to, Ryan, did you have a question for John before I just keep talking? I don't. My question's irrelevant to what we were talking about. <laughs> mine's, mine's, mine's more my brain and wanting to know what kind of stones are around the local area that he's in in China, because that's how my brain works. But. Okay. Okay. So before we do that, because that is a valid question for sure. <laughs> I get, I, some good, to, I get some good stories for you for yeah, that. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question that Connie had, had one of our uh, viewers had put up. And she wanted to know what made you buy Highland Park to begin with? That was a pretty bold move, right? So well, what, what, let, what let made me, that happen? Yeah, let me tell you the story about that. Because there's, there's other stories out there about that. But I'll tell you what really happened. So in... Well, in 2005, I'd been working in semiconductor for a long time and, and running big design teams. And, and the problem with semiconductors, everything you make is in the landfill in five years. So I'd come home at night and I would cut spears and cut agates. And that would be like some of the highlights of my day. So I, I got assigned a project to outsource all my engineering team to India. I went out to India. I did that. When I came back, I knew that the end was was coming. All that stuff was going to go overseas. I didn't want to be the guy taking the team apart. So I took a package. I bowed out of that industry, and then I was I was consulting for a couple of years, and I was consulting for semiconductor companies. And while I was doing that, I started uh, thinking about what do I want to do? You know, because I was getting kind of tired of working for other people and. And I always, I always had my original business was a rare earth trading company, which I still have, um, mostly focused on agates and rough rock. Okay. And, um, and I was importing a lot of rough from India. I was importing rough from Turkey. I, I was bringing in a huge amount of rough and turning it because okay. there was just this void for really good rough. Right. And, I had all these people when they were buying rough from me, they always wanted saws and they're like, I don't have a big saw. And, and I, 
you know, I was consulting so I could get jump in a, a rental truck and I could drive all over the country and I could buy up these old saws like crazy, bring them back and rebuild them. And I'm in the process of rebuilding them. And so this is like 2007, maybe. And I was rebuilding these two old Highland Park 24 inch saws. And back then, if I rebuilt one, I could sell it. I could sell it. I can make two phone calls and I could sell it for 3000 bucks. Right. And I was rebuilding one and all the bolts are rusted and everything's it's really kind of a pain. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I could build these things and probably sell them for 3000. And okay. of course, then being an engineer, I was like, well, why don't I do that? And so I started doing the research about the history of Highland Park. And what I found out is that Highland Park had been bought up like back in the mid 70s, Highland Park, basically, they were not adapting and they were running a, a shop down in Southern California. So their cost was pretty high right. and um, and they had a lot of competitors coming in offering lighter sheet metal, like lower cost machines and they couldn't compete and they lost it. And, um, and I don't know what happened. Maybe there's some family dynamic where they don't have anybody that wants to carry it on or something. But what happened is that company got basically broken into two pieces. There was a diamond blade technology that uh, I think uh, Mustos, Mustos Industries, the, the M and MK, uh -huh. they bought, they acquired that piece. And then all the machine side, there wasn't really anybody who wanted to pick up the manufacturing. It got sold off to Contempo. Now, Contempo at that point in time was owned by Bill Ritter. And I didn't know it at the time, but Bill Ritter was kind of like collaborating with Diamond Pacific. And I called up Bill Ritter and I told him what I was wanting to do. And I asked him, are there any patents on any of that stuff? And I, I was not really like I was just wanting to see whether there's anything out there. And he's like, no patents, no trademark. And I've done patent and trademark searches and there was nothing, which means that's anybody can build it. Anybody can do it. And so then I went and I looked online on the USPTO website, which is the US, the US patent and trademark website. Yeah. And I did a search on the trademarks and I saw, interestingly enough, that Bronca had filed a trademark for Highland Park, but there's two parts to filing a trademark. One, you write your thing, you create a mark, and then you file, you pay your $325 or something like that, and then you file it. And then the second piece that you're required to do to get granted the trademark is you got to show you have a product and you have to show that you're selling that product in to the public. Well, they didn't do that and their trademark basically expired and was invalidated. Jeez. I and and I was like it invalidated like 6 months before I I looked at it. So then I created my mark, I filed it, I shut my mouth for like a year and then I my my mark uh, basically the product I actually uh, used for the filing was the bull wheel. And then I was granted the trademark in, yeah, you can look in the database. It was 2009, I think. Um, and that's how I got, there was nothing to buy. Nobody had claimed the trademark. It was dead. Okay. So you didn't actually buy Anybody, Highland Park. Like, you revamped Highland Park. I brought it back. Like okay. they were the best saws ever built, in my opinion. Like, yeah, there's no, some people like, yes. say Nelson are great, but honestly, Highland Park's got Nelson beat. Yeah, I and agree with that. Otherwise, I would have done Nelson's, you know? Right. <laughs> okay, Ryan, what's your question? I, I don't have a question. I'm chilling. Okay. I'm listening to his story. It was amazing. So, Kirsten, do you like you my story? I do. I am. I, um, so besides collecting rocks, I collect old books. And so inevitably, I collect old books about rocks. And I was looking through this rock, gem, and minerals from the 60s. Yeah. And there is a machine in here I have never, ever heard of. 
Um, it's called an overarm slab polisher. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. What? Like, it's is that something that's still in production? Because this, this just, like, seems so random. Yeah, it's basically like what they call, in, in Australia, they call that machine a Jenny Lynn. And basically, it's got an arm that's cantilevered, and there's a shaft. Let's see, I get my hand here. There's a shaft coming down from the arm with a flat disc on it. And, you're, and they put grit on it to do it, but you could use a diamond disc. But the only reason that that's not really what you could do on that that you can't do on other machines is you, if you have a big piece, you can polish a big piece. But okay. um, it's not uh, for most lapideras it's not really a very fast way to finish which is why uh, like if you look there's hardly any of those machines that ever went out in circulation they didn't sell many of those at all okay uh, it's one of those kind of it's an interesting design and certainly you know if you found one there's there's applications for it you probably get acquired pretty cheap because they're not popular <laughs> but um they're an interesting machine and um they, they make bigger ones that are used in the like the granite finishing industry and those are actually you know there there's a lot of those still in production particularly in places that do countertops and sinks and stuff like that that's what i was going to ask if it was that big or so not quite that big yeah if you were doing if you were doing like if you did a whole bunch of inlaid uh petrified wood or agates in a tabletop and you and your tabletop was was you know like three feet in diameter i don't know what the swing on that is but it would be pretty good for that so the arm rotates with the polisher on it yeah the, the the arm the arm if i can get my the arm is kind of like this it moves yeah. like this and out of the arm is this spindle that holds the disc and then the motor drives that and so you can move oh, it around on top of a big slab okay. yeah well, now they make handheld polishers like that where water comes through them you can just sit there and do it and it's completely mobile wherever you want it to go you know? yeah well the difference is with the handheld you got to be careful not to dig oh yeah for sure if you're doing a big slab and you push a little too much or if you have varying hardness the handheld one you'll dig in and then your finished slab will look like, like ripples, ripples. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right right so, right okay I use that machine in my carvings when I do great big carvings. Uh, yeah, right. super, super helpful. Makes it go by so fast. The little nice. handheld concrete okay. polishers. Okay, <laughs> nice. Um, I personally want to know about trim saws. Trim saws. I might be in the market for a trim saw. That's exactly I haven't even got to use it yet. There you go, Dave. Awesome. <laughs> awesome, Dave. So trim what? saws, um, right now, um, I have two different trim saws, but I actually am introducing a third one that we're in the middle of uh, building our first production run on. So the okay. trim saws we have right now are six, a six inch, uh, which is a standard speed six inch uh, replica of an older Highland Park. Um, mm -hmm really a strong utility machine, all cast aluminum, you know, and I did, I, I changed the arbors on all the, the smaller saws like that, because the old HP arbors were not easy to service. Um, okay. And I made them so they take really standard bearings. Uh, if you compare like trim saws, we do a comparison video on the six inch saw with like the rock rascal. Yeah. Um, the Rock Rascal basically is like a Babbitt bearing. What a Babbitt bearing is, it's more like what people will call a bushing. Okay. Um, so it's not precise, and it won't it won't last a long, as long, and it's a little harder to service, honestly, because you'll okay. get you'll get wear on the shaft and on the bushing. So if you replace the bushing, it still might not be tight when you're done on a right. you know on a machine after you use it a while. Um, oh. Let me just say, no. if you put that rock rascal up next to your six inch, that rock rascal is a little girl. Yes, yeah, it, <laughs> like, it looks like maybe a four inch compared to ours. It is small. The six inch HP, you know your, your saw is, is just a monster. It really yeah. is. 
that rock rascal was the first trim saw I ever had. I've got one. <laughs> but but I wouldn't recommend it for people because honestly it's about the same price. So why like, buy this inferior like, unit for the same price? And and you know that's right. that's been our mission all along is how do we make really great equipment? How do we offer it at a good price and make it so it it's easy to service and teach people how to service it? Like so if you look at our your YouTube videos channel, we have I love tons and tons and tons of videos that we're teaching people how to service right. that. Because you know, you can't you know, it's like what are you gonna do? Call lapidary equipment mechanic? There aren't any. Right, right. So what's well, the new one that you're working on? Well, our eight inches that is the high speed. It's a production. Yeah, you said saw. you were working yeah. on a new, a new and one. And the new that... one is a 10 inch. Um, what I did basically is it's a little bit modeled after like the, the 10 inch design that Lortone did, but I changed okay. some stuff on it because I didn't like that. Like they've got a ridiculous drain that like I couldn't even stick my pinky through. And everybody knows when you run a trim saw, you're going to get all kinds of muck in it. And then right. you're going to try and get the stuff out. It's like, why would you put a little dinky drain? There's no point. You're going to scoop it out <laughs> if you have a drain that small. Right. So right. If you notice all my sh machines, I put big drains on. It's like, yeah. this is what happens if you cut rock and you're designing equipment. You know, you don't want a little tiny drain because you can't get anything out of it. Right. Right. So, my okay, favorite I'll probably, trim slides. I'll, I'll probably write on control. that 10 inch then. Yeah, it's got, a, it's got a big drain. I changed the arbor to have a, it's a, a machined 6061 aluminum arbor that has, you know, precision roller bearings. And then the other thing I did that is actually really cool is, and I've been doing more of this. Um, you know what a serpentine belt is like on your car? Yep. It's that yeah. inner flatter belt and it's got all the little fine teeth in it. Yeah. It's called a poly V belt. Uh -huh. Now, the old style V belts are like A series, which is half inch wide, and B series, I think it's three quarters or five eighths, I can't remember. But the problem with V belts is the manufacture of V belts, they're, they're very, very coarse. So they have where they join the ends of the belt is always going to have a bump. So when you're running it, You'll get a thunk, 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 thunk. Mm -hmm. and the problem also is if you walk away from your machine and you go on vacation for two months or you're just busy and then you come back that belt gets that v belt gets a set in it and then it makes it bump more now what i did is on this trim saw i did an experiment i i put a poly v belt on it now the poly v is wider but it's thinner and because it's poly V, it has huge, huge, huge grip capability in a small belt. And it's really quiet, quiet running. So it lowers the noise in the machine. Um, and uh, the poly V pulleys cost a little bit more. Um, I actually machine those in house out of solid steel billet. Um, instead of like all the all the uh, the regular V belt pulleys are, uh, that we use are cast iron, which is good. Uh, it's better than that die cast zinc. It, it, for everybody, if you buy a machine and it has die cast zinc pulleys on it, just plan on replacing those because they're all going to fail. That's just a it's a fixed rule. Those pulleys have a very limited lifetime because it's not even aluminum. It's die cast zinc. It's very soft. It's like the number one problem when you see people use those pulleys, those pulleys fail. And when they fail, if they're left, they'll screw up the shaft and now you're replacing it. And all because somebody saved a few bucks on a pulley. So I won't, you won't see those on my machines. I use cast iron or now this poly V uh, where I machine the pulley. But the, I, I just did the same thing. I put the poly V pulleys on my shaping machine and because before the shaping machine had a fair amount of vibration it is because the motors mounted on the back panel and then the arbors on the top and that the lumpiness of the v-belt would just sit there and and vibrate more than i like and i put the poly v on that and it's just unbelievable the difference that it made so i did that on this 10-inch trim saw 
I know I, I'm going to be really happy with the results of it because I've seen what a difference the Bali V is. Okay. Right. Yeah, understand, I John. Oh, the other My thing wife doesn't like you. What's that now? <laughs> My wife doesn't like you. Why? Is because that? every time you come up with something like this, I have stuff. to have it. <laughs> well, I'm constantly coming up with new stuff. I, you know, I just, I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's kind of funny because I spent uh, all my career building design teams, doing design. Like my first job, I was doing factory automation and robotics in a, in a company. They, they actually, the, the company that invented the valve that goes in the IV drip, the little rubber valve. So I was working there and, um, and I'm having so much fun designing laboratory equipment compared to working in all these other companies. I mean, I did some really cool stuff before. And what's nice is that I can, like, I can start pulling those innovation kind of thinking and ideas into laboratory, which is what I'm working on. I'm actually working on something really, really cool right now. Uh, I'm building two 45 inch saws. So they got 45 inch blades yeah. right now. Now I was wow. building these originally for myself. And um, basically when I started building them, I knew like the bigger the saw gets, the more the problem that you have with feed speed becomes. Because, you know, if you have a log that's like 20 inches in diameter or 18 inches in diameter or something, and you stick a blade through it, when you first start cutting, you know, you're engaging this much. And then it's this much and then it's and then you're in the middle of the log you're 18 inches into the cut and the amount of power that it takes to keep turning that blade and the rate at which you can advance kind of changes so what i am doing on these 45s is i put a programmable uh, programmable logic controller on them and i i got this really cool guy he's actually out of serbia and he's working with me on the programming uh, I, I don't have time to do it. I could do it, but I don't have time to. But he's great to work with. And what we're doing is we're creating a saw that uh, we look at the amperage draw on the main motor. And the PLC controls the drive motor, which is a stepper motor. And we can look at that relationship all the way through the cut. And we can optimize the cutting and also ensure that you never crash it from having excess blade force, which is a huge deal. That's insane. Now, when that I finish insane. this, I've, I've got one of these already sold. Um, and when, when I finish this project, then I'm going to take the same learning and I'm building a really, really, I got most of the design done. I'm building an 18 inch saw that is an auto slabber. So basically, the, the concept of this is you put a rock in and you tell it how thick your blade is and you tell it how thick a slab you want and you tell it, oh, I want to cut one or I want to cut five or I want to cut the whole rock and you push it up. <laughs> I'll guinea pig that for you. Wow. I'll guinea for the guy, you. For the I guy who's say, got a one yeah. man or two man shop, that saw yes. doesn't, like, I know because I did this. Like I would start my saws and the phone would ring and I'd be like, oh, I got to take care of this customer. I'd be on the phone and all my saws 15 minutes later are sitting there doing nothing. Right. And right. this thing is just going to dice and dice and dice and same technology. So I'll be looking at the blade, the motor amperage on the blade. I can auto index all of that. So that's that's what I'm working on. I don't know how long it's going to take me to finish developing it, but when it's you can, done. You can go ahead and put Glacier Bros down. Yeah, for that. Ryan needs that yes, for sure. I do. Yeah. yeah. Brian needs that. A lot of people need it. And, <laughs> and it's a really, like, you know, you kind of have to ask the question, why hasn't anybody, like, okay, you're in an industry that's, uh, okay, started in 1940s, so you got 60, 82 years, nobody's yes. done anything with this. Right, right. So, uh, you know, we're 13 years in and we're probably a little late to get there on it, in my opinion. So, but we're, we're going to apply more and more of that kind of technology. Nice. Um, going, I'm afraid to going ask what back that to that. I don't ahead, know Christian. yet. I don't know yet. 
going back to that 10 inch saw um when are you expecting that to be available for purchase um i'm i i have two molds that i'm making for that because we're doing the plastic uh vacuum formed clear plastic cover for it and mm -hmm. then another stamping mold for a, a spray guard in it um i'm hoping to have units through production by December 15th. Wow. All so right. how does one go about getting on a list for that? Just yeah. call up, just call up my I staff. I just call one of the say, girls. Hey, put okay. me on the list. And they're okay. really good. They're really good at that. And then as soon as I tell them there's some shipping, they just plug everybody in. I'm doing these intarsia machines. We call them an intarsia machine, but they're actually they're actually really going to be great for an entry level machine. What it is, is a, a, like a vertical flat lap, but I, what I did on it that's really nice is I put a, a stainless steel table on it that's precision machine, and then I made fixturing so you can put, you know, like if you want to just use it for doing calving, you just buy the base unit. If you want to use it for doing intarsia, then I have these other fixtures that you know, like, uh, let's say you want to make a six sided box. So now you need a fixture that's got the, what is that 30 degree or 15 degree for depending on whether you're doing, uh, you know, joined uh, angles on the side. If you're doing a square box, you need a 45 degree. So all of these will just drop right onto that and, and you'll get perfect angles every single time, which means nice. that like, cause the whole, the whole thing that makes building something like that difficult is the tools because if you have to hand fit it and you know like and play with the angle on every single one then it, it takes a lot more time if your fixturing and jigging is good so you can just you know grind it to this point every time and then you set the pieces down and everything fits up great then you can produce more faster right right and of course, on a machine like that, you can just do simple calving too. So right. for somebody starting, they don't want to buy a calving machine and all the wheels, they can buy one of these and then they could change out the plates and and be able to be successful. Right, right. Of course, I got people okay. now asking me to do it in variable speed, which. I mean, can we get everything in variable speed, John? Come on, really? Well, I'm, <laughs> you know, like I'll tell you, variable speed has always been a little bit of a challenge because there's the, the cheapo way of doing it and then there's the right way of doing it and then there's new technologies that kind of open up new right ways of doing it. Right. And um, I'm actually looking at uh, some of that for, you know, like the cabbing machines. Um, I've implemented that on all of our flat laps. And I also, I have these big vibratory, have you guys seen my ginormous vibratory tumblers? Yes. I just looked at them. Yeah, I got yeah. variable speed on those, which is really awesome because if you're tumbling something that's more fragile, you can slow it down. Right. And if you're just really wanting to rough off a bunch of agates and stuff, you can speed it up. I'm, I'm actually doing another machine, uh, I got, I got 11 new machines that I have just finished up this fall. Nice. So, but I got another one that I'm working on. Um, you know, for people that are doing a lot of production tumbling, you know, like some volume, um, I got this machine that's basically uh, a pre-roughing machine. It, it rounds off all the corners and it's fast. It's crazy fast. Like if you have, if you have 20 pounds and you want to round off all the, all the sharp corners on them and i don't care if it's flint throw it in this thing you run it for three minutes they're rounded wow what? that's crazy fast yeah, that's, yeah. that's stupid well, fast. And, wow. and here's the thing it's like a weak uh, and, and this kind of comes back to your question ryan around hearing about the market and stuff here so when i came out here i came out actually on a when i first came to china i came on a semiconductor consulting contract big company out here machining company and their engineering needed a lot of work and and so they brought me out here and and i had all my evenings and weekends free so i started like you know okay i know they cut a lot of rock here so i started i found this retired school teacher uh who spoke english and she started 
uh, lining up all these different little trips for me to go out and see, you know, different markets. So stone markets oh, man. and um, equipment markets. And so, of course, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to study everything they're doing. Like the equipment, the equipment that's built here in general looks, it's just horrible. Like, you know, it's <laughs> welded with coat hangers kind of thing. But you, you got to be able to look past that and look at the concept behind the equipment because these like it's not true now. But but um, certainly when I came here 10 years ago, when, you know, 13 years when I first came here, 80 percent of the gemstones cut in the world at that moment in time were cut in China. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so basically, um, basically, you know, they have a lot of technology, like our, the shaping machine we make, it's actually a German machine, a German design, but the Germans had stopped making, making them years ago, and the Chinese started making them. Uh, of course, their copies were freaking horrendous. Everything breaks, nothing lines up, but they work. And that's what they're cranking out beads and all kinds of other stuff on. But I looked at that and I go, oh, we got to do a decent version of this because it's a really powerful machine. You know, if you're doing body jewelry, if you're doing body jewelry and you're grinding that stuff by hand on a cabbing machine, you're just self-defeating. Get a shaper <laughs> and you can produce you can produce 100 times more with the same labor. and You can be competitive then. And that's why when you think about like, you know, all throughout the progression of lapidary arts, you know, as a beginner, you, you want to get simple machines that help you to achieve what you want at, at a low cost. And as you get more into it and you get serious about doing something, if you're serious about doing body jewelry, you, you know, spending money on a calving machine isn't going to get you there. Like it may be a good place to start, but if you're going to be competitive, because, you know, if you end up grinding them by hand, how long are you going to have a set uh, a set of plugs? You're going to have you're going to have an hour, hour and a half, a set of plugs and, and you're going to sell it for what? Was about to say. No, a couple hundred. Well, <laughs> that's literally how we started our company. A couple hundred. <laughs> and <laughs> that's my <laughs> shipping machine, because then you're going to really roll. Depends you're literally like you're telling my life shape. story over there. It's hilarious. So about two and a half years ago, John, that's how I ended up talking to Sherman is I called up to talk to him, to uh, somebody about your shaping machine yeah. uh, because we wanted to use one for our charity to do some things that we do. And so when I called up, uh, it was Lizelle that I ended up talking to. And I said, look, I can get a Chinese made machine for $900. Why should I buy yours? She said, you need to talk to Sherman. So she gets Sherman on the phone and I ask him the same question. He said, well, let me tell you a story. He said, he said, I've got one of those Chinese machines. He said, it cuts okay. He said, but they know nothing about putting a seal in anything. So he ended up getting a some kind of a pan to put under it to catch all of the oil that constantly came out, trying to circulate oh, yeah. it back through. Oh, and yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, that's what we ended up at the time. We had that on order, and then we had to turn around and do something else. But that was one of the reasons, because the, the difference in the way that the machine is made yeah. for, for what you do versus what you can buy. So people have that whole thing, oh, it's made in China, it can't be any good. And I say, look, understand, made in China is just a place where it is, but the quality control and the design right. is different with Highland Park. I mean, I back you guys tremendously because I own quite a bit of your equipment. And it, it, I've had none of it let me down yet. Yeah. Well, it's just like you can buy an iPhone. All the iPhones are made here. Matter of fact, uh, iPhones are made right down the street from me. But it's the mentality of how you manage your crew and manage your factories. Like a lot of factories here, they just want maximum output. They don't care about quality. Right. And and they, I'll tell you, um, as much as I disdain it, those, a lot of those guys have made a ton of money because they because they just did that and it's just not how i want to operate and i'll never operate that way like i'm going to build the best gear and stand behind everything we build and you know like i i, I still get the chance to be on phone calls with customers when they you know when they're learning and they need help and a lot of times i can explain stuff in a way that they can understand that you know maybe my staff doesn't have the same intimate knowledge of the me mechanical stuff that i do 
uh, all the, I have to say they're really coming along. They do know a lot of it now, but um, you know, that's, that's what we're interested in producing and how we're interested in working with people because that's what has people stay with a thing because they, they, they see they can be successful. And it's like, you know, I've talked to people before that, you know, got so frustrated, you know, because they bought, you know, well, in this case, a fellow had bought a Baraka saw and, and he was having all kinds of problems with the feed and, and they didn't fix it, the problem for him. And, and, you know, like, if I don't fix a problem, that's my, that's my problem. Like I will drag the whole machine back and send them a new machine if I need to. But, uh, but that's a difference. You know, like if I do that, I don't, I don't make any money, but I'll keep them as a customer and they'll be happy. For sure. Yeah, and over time that that really pays off. I think uh, that that mentality of 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 the way you're running things there it sounds amazing. Um, I know that uh, tonight's show might run a little long because Dave probably wants to ask a couple questions too. I, well, whenever you're ready for me, I got a couple for him. Go ahead, Dave. I think you haven't had a turn yet. <laughs> I have to decide which question, though, was more important. Um, okay, I'll keep it to two. John, do you play an instrument? Uh, let's see. Uh, can you see it? I'm sitting right in the way. There it is. Woo. Uh, that's Baseball what I figured. Is that yeah. a jazz master? So a lot of people don't know that uh, that John and uh, Sherman used to be in a band or are still in a band or whatever it is you're doing. And uh, yeah, we haven't had a band for a while. Yeah, I play guitar, and so that was really a, a thing to, you know, when I saw that and I found that out, and I thought, yeah, I'll play a, a Paul Reed Smith. And so I just knew you had to have something nice. The one thing I've really been waiting to ask you, and, and you and I have talked a little bit in, in chat and Messenger, is uh, you know we buy rock tumblers and we give the kids who have autism. Yep. And so a couple of years ago, uh, Sherman told me about what you guys were working on with your three pound series of rock tumblers, and yep. that is just something I really want to to find out about and have you be able to tell the people about. Um, he told me he said I can guarantee you one thing. He said it will compete with a lore tone, which is what we buy for these kids because right now. That is on the market. That's what is really a pretty good tumbler. And but uh, some of the things that I heard in your video that you were talking about, I think people are going to be interested in. All right. Well, um, I can't remember what I said in the video, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I did. So when I when I started. Uh, like for a long time, I was like, I'm not going to build tumblers. I don't want to build tumblers. And then and then I was talking to I was talking to somebody and and um, and basically what I realized is the tumbler business is probably about uh, is probably about a five million dollar a year business if you take all the manufacturers and bundle them up, which uh, when you think about that that's kind of crazy, and um, and a lot of what's out there is pretty bad rubbish like. Uh, I think the winner of the worst rubbish is probably the National Geographic tumbler. <laughs> I agree 100%. Oh, those are yes. And in Darcy as well. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, and, and you know, I'm kind of taking a shot at them, but, but he, here's why I, I say that and, and why I kind of, like when I look at it, I just kind of get offended. And, and here's why. Because you're given a device to a kid who could be inspired and who could be in and pursue the this as a lifelong hobby and the thing is going to fail it's going to fail and then the kid's right. going to be disappointed and it's like well and and that national geographic one you can't fix anything in it no no they're throwaway so there's two principles behind what i did with Tom. number one I wanted the design to be straightforward, simple, reliable, and completely serviceable and s simple to service where literally a kid could service it. Um, so basically 
if you look at okay uh you've got the harbor freight one you got Lortown, you got L ligu or whatever that one is um there's a couple others but they all basically look the same yeah. thumblers uh thumb thumblers is a little bit different but same basic concept right. their barrel their barrel is different all those others are, are almost identical barrels so True. our barrels are basically the same as the like they look the same as like the all of those tumblers that i just named um and um we are making uh the three pound the double three pound the triple 1.5 pound the 4.5 pound uh and i'm working on six and 12 pounds and then i also um well i'm gonna kick off diamond pacific probably but i'm basically doing a similar tumbler to their what they call their 65 and their 75 um but the foundation for all the tumblers the all the frameworks are stainless steel like painted steel wow. power coated steel i mean you got grit and water all over these things i'm going to right. stainless steel yeah I, what i realized is the cost delta and the quality delta it isn't worth trying to save a few pennies in the framework so that there's that then um the pulleys that i'm doing are all cnc machined aluminum I don't do the stamped steel formed with an o-ring for a belt because o-rings suck as belts yeah. they're, they're not a good belt they're hard to adjust and if you get them too tight then the tumbler doesn't start on its own blah blah so i'm going to a little uh polyurethane v belt which is really durable it's really reliable and it's easy to adjust so aluminum pulleys poly v belt and polyurethane v belt and then i've got uh nylon bushings i i was thinking about going to bronze but um the problem with bronze is that you do have to uh if you get grit around on it it's it, it uh the oil impregnated bronze the grit just glues itself to it uh which is not good the nylon's better because it's going to shed it better if it somebody spills some grit around it oh, yes. um so that's the core of it the motors are basically the same they're all shaded pole motors i basically boosted the torque on them 20 percent um so simple reliable and i think i'm going to beat lord Tone's price too well and john i like to knock the edges off in my rotary tumblers and then i throw this into my uv18 to finish them off and i know you have the big that uh what is that a 40 pound uh vibratory that you've got are uh, you going to make a smaller one i i, I oh, that one that big one you can probably put close to 80 or 90 pounds in that you don't have to but you can i mean it's it's for for the money what you can produce in that is really impressive. I have a number of customers using those and uh, I'm getting really positive reviews on them. Um, I am, uh, and, I, and I will tell you this, that is the most popular size of production tumbler here in China. Most wow. popular in lapidary. Now they also, they also uh, uh, essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking a lot of their concepts there and I'm just you know i'm building competitive stuff yeah. they they never ground a single piece of equipment there's never a ground wire on any equipment uh they're not much for belt guards or things like that so you know like i'm looking at that that kind of stuff to make sure that the equipment is built right and you know finished right so i probably will come out with um i'm thinking like a 14 inch of that size you know if you compare it to like the rate tech one that has the plastic the blue plastic barrel yeah again in my opinion that's a tumbler that deserves some disdain because it, the plastic one that's an eighth right. of an inch thick and you're gonna put grit and rock in it like how long the barrel gonna last it's not gonna last very long at all 
if you look at our big tumbler, it's got uh, it's got a steel bowl with a, a polyurethane liner, and that liner is probably more than a half inch thick. Wow. I mean, you're gonna this gonna take you a long time to wear it out. Right. Yeah. Well, in that I mean, rain tech, you. Uh... You know, you, like you take that down to the local feed store and fire it up and drive back home where you don't have to listen. To it. Well, it's actually surprisingly quiet. No, I was talking about the Raytech. They don't have oh, yeah, those, the they don't have those pads it, and stuff. It's yeah. all just the plastic. Yeah. And uh, so much of the stuff nowadays, that's the way it is. Yeah, I, I like, I, well, I, I keep saying this, and I know at some point in time it's going to come back and bite me, but I, like, I really hate plastic in lapidary equipment. Me too. For sure. I'm glad because because for most applications it's not the right thing. Right. I, I I I will grant that there's probably some applications where it's okay, but in general, um, you know, like lapidary equipment, it, it works hard to cut rock. <laughs> well, and you have a reputation, John, for building equipment that lasts a lifetime. I mean, that's you know that's the direction it goes. Well, that's and, the direction. Uh, that plastic just doesn't do that. Yeah. He says it in a ton of his videos, that's the direction that him and Sherman reach for on everything is they wanted to be able to last. Right. So, yeah. Um, I want to know, because I ask every guest that comes on, what's your favorite stone? I want to know what's My your favorite, favorite stone. stone. Oh, yeah. that's an easy, that's an easy one for me. Probably, if I, if I speak as a category, it would be um banded agate and speaking specifically it would probably be laguna yeah i always see that on your website and i'm like damn it's so expensive but i want some it is <laughs> i just want i just want to save up and buy a huge one from you guys just be yeah like, oh, just one big one just one big one. yeah well i'll tell you I, I i'll tell you if you like banded agates i got a little agate the almejo it's mm -hmm. really inexpensive comparatively and there's some super sweet stuff in that yeah really super sweet stuff like this is a great banded agate for somebody who's on a tighter budget who's a beginner who wants really good colors because uh like if you compare it to botswana agate the almejo yields way 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 better oh really yeah red, we, we've seen so many botswanas um the lagunas are great, but you you got to be very very serious. I mean, I'll tell you the difference is one, uh, the the almejo comes from uh, uh, almejo is Malawi, I believe. Um, okay. Malawi or Mos it's Malawi, I believe, but it's all dug by hand by people who are probably you know like they're working for almost nothing by our state uh, because there's yeah. no jobs there so they're all happy if, if you know like i bought a basically i bought a container of that i bought a full container of it um so i have a lot um but they were they were thrilled because there aren't many people who buy a container of agate from them um but if you compare that to the mexican mining um for the mexican stuff i'm, I'm working with my good friend Andres Carrillo and uh, we basically used excavators to move a mountain to get yep. that agate that's why yeah. it's expensive and it's more expensive now because the diesel's gone up wow if I told you the numbers of how much money was spent and how much agate come came out it, it would probably blow your mind yeah, it would probably make me mad because I just want one. Thinking about all of them. <laughs> Put it this way. It, 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 it was, it was uh, seven figures. Oof. Oof. Yeah, no, my favorite color is purple, and I always see those with, like, crazy purple colors in them, and I'm like, why do I need that so bad? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, well, I'll tell you, the Koyamido that came out of the Mornitas deposit is the one that you would like the most. Well, John, send me a care package. Well, I'm going <laughs> to, I actually, I actually, Stop it. <laughs> um, I actually get to come back here probably in December. And I'm going to, like, I haven't been 
able to cut any agates for a long time because I've just been building equipment. But I'm going to come back and I'll go to the warehouse and spend time there. And uh, you'll have to remind me when I get back and I'll, I'll dig you out a rock. Okay. No, I'll message you. If I know you're going to be there, I'll be like, John, I need these in this color, please. <laughs> Yeah, purple, so, rare color, and box. So, John, a lot of uh, a lot of people, everybody knows that you make saws. I mean, that seems to be the thing that everybody knows. Highland Park, they make saws. But what is it that people don't know about what you do? Well, you know, we we've done um, we've done a lot of innovating. Uh, like for me, uh, I got into lapidary you know, obviously when I was 10 and, um, and then, uh, and then in the, in the eighties, I, I was a pretty avid marble collector and I collected the old, the old handmade glass marbles, the ones that are made from canes. But one of my favorite marbles to collect was the old German handmade agate marbles. Wow. And of course, I was living in Ohio at that point in time. And, you know, I get in Ohio, you ain't going to get much. And um, I discovered I'd gone through this little shop in Custer, South Dakota on one trip. It was a family trip. And it was it was one of these cool, cool go to every rock shop kind of trips, you know. And we we're at this rock shop. And, you know, after this rock shop in Custer, South Dakota, it was like you go east and there's nothing. So it was kind of like the last thing. And this guy had all these killer Lakers, really great red and white banded Lakers. Just the best I've seen. And I'm like, I'd been to Lake Superior. I never found anything. And I asked oh, this guy, I'm like, you got so much great agates. And I was, I was fairly young then. Um, and he goes, uh, he goes, you want good agates? He goes, go to Muscatine, Iowa. I'm like, Iowa? <laughs> So I believed him and, and I got us to divert a little bit south to go through Iowa, got to Muscatine, Iowa, and pulled into this gravel pit where he said to go. And of course it's the middle of the week and they're all running and I'm I don't know I don't know anything about the rules for gravel pits at that point in my life. And I go in there and I'm standing in the office for a few minutes and and, uh, and one of the workers comes up and he goes, Can I help you, son? I go, I, I was hoping I could look for some agates. He goes, you want agates? Come here. And I thought he's going to take me out back to some pile away from the equipment stuff. He takes me over to this little, this little switch house where they turn on the equipment the, for the conveyors and stuff. And there on the floor of the switch house was all these milk, um, milk cartons with the tops torn off full of agates. Now I'm about having a heart attack and he goes, Oh, some guy used to come and buy these, but he hasn't been back in years. You want them? I'm like, I'm nodding. Yeah, I want them. And he grabs a gunny sack and he dumps them all in a gunny sack. And here I I've been in this place now for maybe five minutes. And of course the family's all sitting in the car going, Oh God, John, it's gonna be two hours. You know, and and so I come around the corner lugging this, I don't know, I probably had sixty five pounds worth of agates in there. And I come around the corner with that and I climb in the back of the car and plop it down on the floor and they're like you're done i'm like yeah i'm done <laughs> anyway that prompted me making a lot of agate marbles out of lakers which are absolutely stunning in marbles and and i know some of the guys up at moose lake that you know come in there that there's some good marble makers there but that influenced a lot of my thinking about equipment because I started building, actually I was building machines back then. So I started building sphere machines back then. And um, I basically produced a, a shop. When I moved to California for semiconductor, I had a rental house with 35 sphere machines and a bunch of saws in the garage. And, and I had a guy working for me full time cutting spheres. And that's when I, that's when I developed the high speed sphere machine. And that's when I developed, I'd had the low speed machine forever. Um, and that's when I developed the core drill. 
uh, because I was looking at the process going, this is stupid. Why is everybody grinding with silicon carbide? So I developed diamond cups. I developed segments for core bits that would actually cut. I, I tried buying all these other people's core bits they say are so great. Well, they won't cut hard rock because they're designed for concrete and asphalt. It took me quite a few years of studying how diamond tools work to understand how to make my own segments so I can have segments that will actually cut hard material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the opposite of what you think. You cut hard material, you want soft segments. You cut soft material like concrete and asphalt, you want hard segments. Because the mud coming off your slab saw, it feels like silk. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't wear the it doesn't wear the bit very much. And if you got a hard segment, it just stops cutting. Oh no I new see. diamond exposed. I see. So the, those were probably the high speed machine, the core drill, those are those are really some of our big innovations but then of course um we came out with the everclean which was you know like when i was I cutting want. when i was cutting I spears in, in this little shop my biggest problem was how do i get rid of my sludge and how do i get rid of my spent grit i was buying 500 pounds of 80 grit every month wow now, <laughs> uh, when I went to Diamond, when I went to Diamond in my shop, my whole thought was, I don't care if it costs more. I just am sick of having grit get tracked in my house everywhere. So I changed everything over to Diamond, and all of a sudden, my tooling costs plummeted. And I was like, holy cow, I didn't expect that. I thought, oh, it's going to cost more because, you know, the diamond, you know, the diamond tools are more expensive, but the reality is the grit was more, way more expensive and it was way, way less output. So, you know, like right. if you're coarse grinding a sphere on uh, with grit and you could be on coarse grind, if you're doing a Brazilian agate, you're going to be on coarse grind for eight hours. Now, if I preform it with a core drill and coarse grind it, eh, 15 minutes. Wow. Huge difference. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So, you know, like nobody, nobody else thought about offering any kind of technology or develop that kind of technology. So I developed it and then I started offering it to people. And, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, quite like we sell a lot of sphere cups, a huge amount of sphere cups. Um, like it's been, uh, that's been one of the areas of challenge to make them fast enough. Um, and we implemented a whole bunch of new tools for um, inventory management and planning because that has been really complicated because it moves so fast that you can't you can't physically yourself look at the system at 3000 different items and hope that you find the ones that you need to make. You got to have a system that tells you. So we've done that. That's been a big part of what we've done over the last year and a half is implementing all that. I, I I'd like to know what's your number one biggest seller? Um well, Mineral in, oil. Machine, <laughs> in machines um in machines I would say it's probably a tie between the model sixteen and the model of uh, the H T fourteen. Those two saws are the most popular saws that we sell. I mean, we saw a lot of all the saws, but those like, um, it, you know, when I first started building saws, it, you, you'll find this funny. My first year building saws, I built 10 18s and 10 24s. That was the first year I built 10 of each 20 saws. OK. Um, and of course, I was flying back and forth between here in China and, and U.S. Then the second year, uh, I think a second year, maybe we built maybe we built 40 of each and then i had bull wheels and 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 at the end of the second year i started building the 16s and it's like uh i you know i haven't even sat down and look at how many we built this year but uh, i i would guess 1500 yeehaw that's awesome wow so is that something that you only build when you get an order for it or is it something you build and then wait well, 
you know, like, okay, um, <laughs> at the end of 2020, I was looking at almost a million dollars in back orders. Oof, and we wow. were just like pull, pulling our hair out because we're like our salespeople working so hard to, you know, work with people and have them be patient. And, and meanwhile, we're ramping the crap out of our production. I moved the factory. Uh, we were in a much smaller building. So I moved the factory um, that year and um, I added a bunch more CNC machining centers. We have 20 CNC machining centers now. Um, which that's a kind of a major investment. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, and, um, and we're pulling more and more, we're, we're vertically integrating. So we have almost everything in house now. And actually one of the things I, I tell people, I want to, I want to start making motors because motors are, they're one of the most difficult suppliers uh, to mm -hmm. get reliable, like, and, and we do pretty, we do pretty good, but we've had some, we've had some issues with them and you know it's definitely uh i would say if i look at the things that uh i want to see us improve it, and motors would be the top probably the top one you know it, it's i would say it's maybe one percent one and a half percent uh but for me that's still too much um i don't uh, like i don't like that kind of a problem um so you know i kind of gives you a feel for it yeah well i think we have run over our allotted time today and it has just been an absolute pleasure to like listen to you talk and tell your stories they have been so so great yeah, um, to you guys. <laughs> well we like that we want you to pick a number for the giveaway john so um i have that everyone's name and a number listed next to them. So go ahead and pick a number between one and 10. How about seven? Seven is D Trent. All right, D Trent, I am gonna have you send me an email. Let me get my email posted up here for you. But send me an email to rockandraccoon777 at gmail.com with your information for shipping, and I will get that sent right out to you. John, I would love to know one last question. Do you have any books or recommendations um, besides, I know that you have your YouTube channel where you guys teach classes. Do you have anything else that you'd recommend to new beginners? Hmm. Um, well, besides getting involved, if there's a local club around you, that's always a good thing. Um, actually, you know, it's, it's challenging because there are, uh, there are limited resources. I would say two things, and this depends on the level of beginner that you are. The William Holland School of Lapidary. We've been doing a fair number of web webinars with those guys. And I'll tell you, I'm really impressed with the caliber of their instructors. And their classes are very inexpensive. You know, like literally like 500 something for tuition for a week or something in classes. <laughs> uh, and, and they're a nonprofit. This is why they do that. They're a nonprofit and they're very committed to the lapidary arts. So I would say, you know, if you're close to them, it's a no brainer. Just go. If you're not close, uh, it would be a great trip. You know, find somebody, you know, a friend to go there. The, the amount that you could learn in one week and how fast you can advance your knowledge, because everything about learning lapidary arts has to do with finding mentors who can give you information and shorten the amount of time that it takes for you to learn a thing. And it also will shorten or minimize your cost. Like if you are trying to teach yourself something, you're more likely to have a problem. Maybe you waste material or maybe you uh, have a problem with machine or something like that. If you've got mentors, if you've got people who can teach you and, and, you can follow this 
this helps you eliminate a lot of that. And that's been a big part of our impetus. Like we do tons and tons and tons of videos. I love what you guys are doing here, sharing information because it's a lot the same thing. William Holland School of Lapidary. Uh, the, also Don Laufer out of Pennsylvania. He's got a little, uh, you know, learning studio. He, he teaches fasting, calving, making bowls. He, he was on our webinar tonight making pens. He's, he's actually somebody who's also very uh, good for a beginner to start working with because, again, a great teacher, really skilled artist, and has a, like, everybody we've met, they have this very low-key, even-keel, great teacher kind of persona where you could just absorb this information from them and they guide you. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more educators out there and you know we're working to get more and more of those connected to to us and and showcase them in our webinars because we really like what they're doing awesome awesome is there anything else before we end the show tonight that you would like to share with our lovely audience well, only thing I would say, and my is because my salespeople would kick my butt if I didn't say <laughs> that. We got, our, we got our Black Friday sale going right now, ten yeah. percent off. And uh, oh, I did want to tell you, uh, like you know, I, we were talking a little bit. I told you we're like almost a million in back orders. We have eliminated almost all of our back orders. It's down to a very small number now. We have stock on pretty much everything because I built twice as much this year as last year by by the end of this year, it'll be twice as much. It's awesome. Which is a lot. Congrats. So we That's have awesome. a huge amount of stock. I've got two containers on the water. I got two more containers leaving. By the end of this year, I think we'll have shipped 24 containers. Wow. Oof. A lot of gear. That's a lot There's of a lot of artists. They need you guys. <laughs> Okay, guys, so how we normally end the show is we give everyone one last minute to say something to the audience, and then uh, I kick you guys off, and we all have a good night. So, uh, Dave, did you have anything else that you'd like to add? Maybe um, talk about your charity for just a minute. So we, we have a charity. If you'll go to Facebook and go to Rock Tumblers, two words, Rock Tumblers for Autism. Uh, a few years ago, um, because I'm a special education teacher, um, we decided to buy a rock tumbler for a kid who had autism and it worked out so well, we decided to continue doing it. And to date, we've now given away 25 of them. And, uh, so you come on there. We just talk a little bit. We sell some pop sockets, do some different things to raise funding and everything that we do, we send out rock tumblers to those kids. That's awesome. Great. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to take you out now. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, what do I want to know? What do I have for him today? Well, first of all, put the bell on. Like and subscribe, please. Come join us every week. Um, share your knowledge, guys. If, if you know things and you're in Lapid area and you have an opportunity to teach other people things, teach them everything that you can. Because that's you spreading your seeds throughout the world for people to remember you, right? Not just that, but... You know, you're helping grow a community that's awesome. I love the lapidary community. Um, our hobby, our hobby became our life, you know, most of us. So it consumes you in the best kind of way. But just stay safe. Everybody enjoy your day. I'll see you later. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Oh, John, thank you so much for being on all the way thank from me. magical China. And uh, I look forward to future conversations with you and learning about more and new things and innovations that you're going to come up with. Yeah, well, we keep working on it. Thanks much for having me. Oh, it was all our pleasure. Oh, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight for season or er, season two, episode nine of Rock Talk. And uh, let's see, we will be back next week at the same time. So if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to send them to me in my email that I already posted tonight. And if you're listening to us on Spotify, thank you. And we look forward to uh, 
many, many, many more shows. Thanks.